Welcome to WonderCon at Home 2020, the year WonderCon comes to you online. Uh, this is the science of Westworld. We've been talking about this a couple of times at previous conventions. After each season, we've talked about the entire show, the run of the series, Westworld on HBO, where modern science and future science crash together in the Wild West and then come home. Panelists. Who are each of you? Start with any of you and then work your way back to me. I'm Anthony okay, Francis. I guess I should, oh. oh, Alan, go first. No, I, I think you, you start talking first. You go for it, Anthony. Not being I'm Anthony. So <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors. I'm Anthony Francis. I'm a roboticist working for Google uh, with a background in uh, robot pets and cognitive science. And uh, I wrote uh, uh, an article for West Westworld Psychology. Cool. Okay, I guess, I guess I'll go next. I'm Alan Pan. I am a failed myth buster and a YouTuber. And uh, uh, yeah, I guess that's, that pretty much sums it up. This is not my real hand. <laughs> I'm Erin Curry. I'm a psychologist, also a proud contributor to Westworld, uh, Westworld psychology. I uh, have also had the opportunity to write for a couple of other uh, of our books as well, because I just am a great big nerd for all things uh, science and uh, psychology. And I'm Tamara Robertson. I am a chemical and biomolecular engineer, but most of you probably know me from Mythbusters, Mythbusters Search, Mythbusters Junior. If it's Mythbusters and it's been the last couple of years you've seen me. Uh, other than that, I also like to prank people with science on PsyJinx. So. And I am Dr. Travis Langley, professor of psychology at Henderson State University, at Superherologist on Twitter, best known as the author of the book, Batman and Psychology, A Dark and Stormy Night, the editor and lead writer on a series of other books, including Westworld Psychology, Violent Delights. Thank you out there in the interwebs for joining us. And thank you panelists for joining me here and letting us communicate face-to-face-ish uh, with fellow human beings. <laughs> this uh, TV series Westworld, which grew out of the old Michael Crichton film Westworld, very different story. We had wanted to talk about the original film in our Westworld Psychology book, but there's so much more to talk about with the television series and any of the issues you can talk about with the old movie also come up in the film. One, we can simply get into why in the world would anyone want to go to Westworld or Samurai World or Future World or Medieval World, some from the film, some from the TV series. Why would people want to go to any of these things? I feel like it's, I feel like it's like playing make-believe as a grown-up, right? You know, like you don't have to stop using your imagination. And if anything, your imagination is now coming to life and you get to interact with it in real time. So I feel like the adventure and the curiosity like would lead me there. And then just the awe-inspiring technology builds that they did as an engineer, I would be geeking out the whole time and just trying to figure out how all of it works. I'd probably spend more time trying to figure it out than actually immersed in just enjoying being there. <laughs> I think the idea of yeah. trying on different selves, like being in a new setting, being in a storyline, wearing different costumes, um, having a different persona, I think is really attractive. So maybe trying out a little new thing that without it necessarily having to reflect on who you are as a whole person gives you a little bit of license to play a little bit and so I think that opportunity to role play something else can be a nice little vacation from the self. What about that role playing? Because the kind of people who are going to be our audience, many of them are accustomed to role play, cosplay uh, at other venues. Why do people want to do this sort of role play? Some of you cosplay, I know. Why do you? There's it's photographic connection, evidence. Right? <laughs> right? Like, you know, when you, you, you put on the, the Green Lantern ring and the costume, it, it puts you, uh, it creates this, you know, visceral connection with this, these worlds you have uh, of story that you've built in your head from watching 
movies, reading comic books. And I can only imagine that if you're like actually not just, it's like LARPing, right? You know, it's one thing to put on the sword and to, to say, oh, I'm a bar 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 barbarian or have the, you know, the wand and, and do it. But then if you actually like wave the wand and someone falls over in a LARP, that's a, 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 just a delight. And now here you're saying you can go to a, a whole park, uh, a, a dream park, uh, if you are a fan of Larry Niven, where this happens all the time, that would be amazing. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking here, it's a, it's a theme park and a, a comic book convention and a video game all kind of rolled up into one giant thing that also happens to be something that you could like definitely want to brag about on Instagram because it costs, it's got to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to visit that park, right? Like how much is a ticket to Westworld? It's got to be expensive. In the old movie, it was not nearly expensive enough for everything that had to be involved. It was just a few thousand dollars. <laughs> they talked like it was a big ticket. Yeah. Like, no, that's just like super Disneyland. Um, yeah, the, well, the, I mean, it, in, the, in the show, they're like terraforming parts of the earth to like they're making like a fake Mount Fuji. It's like that. Mm, that seems very expensive. <laughs> I think even if you have robot labor doing it, it there's got to be some economics to that. And and in the, the days of the movie, there were, if you watch stuff at the same time, it's very Austin Powers with people going like, ah, I want, uh, you know, $10,000 in ransom. And you're like, <laughs> even back then, real people were were extorting people or, or co think costing more money. Like the $6 million man would have cost more than $6 million even then. I'm sorry. I think there's also an interesting thing about like, how dark can you go? You know, the idea of, you know, you know, poking at some of the parts of ourselves that maybe we fear, but not have a consequence for it. You know, taking it one step further and one step further, and one step further, would I, would I, would I, would I, but it's fine. No consequence, nobody really died. Um, so maybe, you know, just seeing how, how deep that hole goes, maybe even. I think too, the pricing may vary depending on how deep you want that hole to go, right? Like we see like the man in black the whole time, he's, he's off grid and he's getting to do all of these things that other people aren't getting to do. So obviously he's likely paying a lot higher of a premium than the normal park goers that are just like going into the tavern, getting a drink and then coming back out. So I think that could be part of that funding, too, to make it so that <laughs> the park is substantiating itself. And we also find out, we're talking about the funding, uh, we find out they're making a whole lot of money by selling their data. <laughs> Are we Which allowed to talk about Zoom being on a Zoom meeting? <laughs> or is, that, is that relevant or is that not relevant? <laughs> It if if Alan suddenly disappears, we know that, that it's not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> you hear me, Zuckerberg? I'm on to you. <laughs> well, and it's, and it's something that we see come to a head in, in season three, right? Because Insight's name is on everything. You know, the cell phones have it as the network listed. The home security system has it listed. It's got all the data, it's running all of the different scenarios. So it's like, obviously, and they say over and over again, they got into the data game before privacy rights became a thing. And it's like, okay, so is that, that person's already getting that data now, you know? And we see that in the, the first couple of seasons of the park and we find out that they're, they're mining all that data and that's where the money is coming from. Which is amazing as, as a data geek that just makes my little heart melt and get really excited of like, if you imagine like what we could do with that much behavioral data, you know, what kind of, it, it's hard enough to do research with really um, elaborate factors and human beings are so complex that when you narrow it down to one factor, you lose so much richness, but when you include so many factors, then you don't have enough data, but this has all of the data. You could make such amazing uh, scientific advancements if you had that much data about human behavior across like setting, like, oh, this is how Joe acts at home. This is how Joe acts at work. This is how Joe acted at Westworld. It'd be immense. And because you could create a new show, couldn't you? And they, they can very 
specifically target particular sorts of psychology, even though we see such a heavy focus on the sex and violence as they're visiting these parks, they can design little things along the way to reveal more of the personality, but is it their real personality or their personality they're playing in that moment? Now, the man in black says this is when they show their true selves, but we, we know from like these tests, people say, oh, which Harry Potter character are you? And then they have these 16 questions or however many questions to go plug them into what is essentially a Myers-Briggs uh, personality type inventory. They're using versions of real psychological inventory and getting people to take these questionnaires for fun. And now somebody somewhere has a file that they're putting together what you said on this personality test together with that personality yep. test, together with those things you did. Mm -hmm. I see, see Aaron nodding away. Uh, <laughs> I don't take them anymore, next to never. Okay. Sometimes I succumb, because yeah. I'm just like, <laughs> like, oh my gosh, all of this data from all of these places, plus my search history, what I'm posting on Facebook, oh no. <laughs> Are you a Ravenclaw? Well, beyond all of that, because you you have this this whole thing where like like today we're we're doing this stuff where we take a whole bunch of pictures and uh, and try to turn them into a set of new pictures, but that's never gonna have like the experience that the artist had that led them to paint the picture. But now in Westworld, we can set up a whole set of scenarios. Now a person you know experiences this and then they do that, and that's a kind of modeling that we can't do today. Yeah. And they would have insights into human experience that would just be a, a, almost unachievable with, by modern standards. That's another reason to do it out in the middle of the ocean. They're outside any country's ethical guidelines. Oh, yeah. And privacy laws. <laughs> The particular. Well, I, think, uh, I think any standards that the EU had would probably apply to their website, at the very least. <laughs> yeah. This, yeah, the websites that we have go all over the world. Westworld conducted in a particular conducted in a particular location, which back in season one, people mm -hmm. were speculating on whether or not that could possibly be Mars. And my simple answer on that was why it couldn't possibly be Mars is that you cannot scale gravity. Mm -hmm. They could adjust all sorts of other things, uh, but they could, the gravity was Earth gravity, and that was why they had to be on Earth. Yeah, their horses would probably gallop real funny on Mars. <laughs> Very I long mean, strides. If they can change gravity, then it's practically the holodeck. And you can't even say, it. like, if it could be on Mars, but they change the gravity, it could be on Venus or Jupiter or whatever. Like, there's no way to know, right? So it's, I think it has, it, it, you know, that, that quote, I, I agree with you, Travis. Now, among the things they're studying will be obviously how they act toward their fellow human beings and their fellow and their their droids, their hosts, and when it's clear or not. Some people, some people going into these parks aren't necessarily going to care whether they're shooting at a person or a host. They don't even really get into showing us one human getting mad and punching the other in the face. Aside from being main characters, we know what Billy does to Logan eventually, though. So we have the data on what they do to real human beings. They, they have data on what they do to hosts that they know are not hosts, and then toward those where they get lost in the fantasy. How people act toward the machines. We, we, we've talked among ourselves, uh, a number of us have talked about how people act toward their machines. Are you, you know, being nice to your toaster just in case the machines rise and they remember how you treated that toaster? Do people view machines and objects in their lives as pets, companions, or some other kind of attachment? I think it's it's not even like it, you don't even have to have a robot to to like sort of extend feelings of humanity towards it, right? I think humans uh, tend to anthropomorphize things very easily, um, and that includes like very very extremely inanimate objects. Um, Earlier, I think like was it a year ago, two years ago now, um, when we had Sarah here, another panelist, she she built herself a robot child, a son, but it doesn't look human at all. It kind of looks like a little spider, but it's a robot. Um, and I, I I was trying to make a point that you know a lot of people kind of assume that if you had Westworld, that everyone 
person who went there would turn to this like so monster just because like oh there's no real consequences but I, I think it's such a hard thing to sort of uh, uncouple or decouple um, just the natural sort of extensions that our mind makes towards inanimate objects especially objects that look like people um, I mean you can you can see this with like MRI scans of, of people with a fake hand next to the real hand and uh, if, if you kind of stroke the fake hand when it's next to your real hand, you could actually see the same neurons lighting up in your head that would normally be responsible for telling you that your hand is being touched, even when it's a completely fake one. Um, and it's, it's funny that, that people think like, once I get to this park, I'll be murdering everyone, I'll be pillaging. It's like, I don't think you would. I think you'd be pretty much the same kind of person you normally would be. I, let's see. So here, look, this is not even a person. This is a little Pikachu. It's not even a real animal. And I can guarantee you that this is going to elicit some kind of a response <laughs> from someone watching. Even clearly, clearly, this is, not, this is not an animal. It was never an animal. It has nothing resembling a real animal. This is a real knife. But like doing this, there is something, there's some part of, I think, most people watching this that is definitely cringing just the sight of this. And you think you're going to go to a park and you're going to shoot a robot guy in the head. I don't think so. It, it's, ra know. it's a rational response to the situation, right? Like if you, if you think something is not animate and screw up, right? You could hurt one of your tribe mates. You could get eaten by a tiger. Uh, you could fail to respond to the cry of your own child. And so, you know, you know, and we get hacked by that, like cats come up and they make these baby like cries and we're like, Ooh, well, maybe we should, you know, give food to this things. And then that develops into a 10,000 year relationship. And I think here you have like these, these machines that we've made to mimic us and to elicit all the same responses by smart people and their learning. I, I, I think that you would have a lot of, now I, I do think some people, you go into the, there's a sense of a release like if you get into improv and you put on a mask there's a, a phenomenon that can happen where like a character seems to take you over and you do things that you would never do not wearing the mask and that that i think like in the park you're going to have some people are going to be more you know like they would be because they're they're off in this i, I can get to the be the person i always wanted to be and there's going to be other people where it's like wow that's that's really torn away uh, a bit of the veil from what was under, you know, under the facade. That actually reminds me, Travis, uh, that's, that's kind of like what happened with uh, was the, the Stanford prison experiment. Uh, that, that's sort of like, you know, when, when sort of people had these roles <coughs> that they took on, even when, you know, they knew it was clearly uh, part, of, part of a fake or a contrived sort of setting. Um, they they ended up being very mean. I don't, I I'm I'm not a psychologist. Do you do you have more more insight about the Stanford prison experiment? Because that's just what like rang that rang a bell in my head about that. The Stanford study, the simulation where Zimbardo randomly assigned people to either play the roles of guards or play the roles of prisoners in this basement at their university, and those in the roles of guards. Many of them became more aggressive, much worse acting, maybe versions of themselves, maybe falling into a role. The one who acted the worst, he said he was mainly emula emulating a particular movie character. And, and he felt he was doing it in response to Zimbardo's directions. He thought that was what was wanted. So we've got growing discussions about, does the Zimbardo prison study completely show what it was said to study, or were they more following his orders? But you definitely see a good demonstration of the potential for somebody being in a particular role acting. There have been a lot of other studies, uh, uh, studies in which people are anonymous. They act less consistently with their own personal values and more in line with the situation, which might make them act worse than they would otherwise because of that disinhibiting and that de-individuation, although it could make them, make them act better than they would have otherwise if the predominant cue in the environment leads people to behave better. So anonymous, you might act like the other Boy Scouts when you wouldn't have at home. Anonymous, you might be more ready to help with the cross burning than you would have otherwise. <laughs> 
I think Star Trek world versus, you know, cyberpunk world, you would have like the same, like, you know, oh, wait, I might go to either one of those, right? I'll probably act really different in a Star Trek uniform as a bridge officer. Like, well, yes, let's try to evacuate those people as if I'm, you know, I got a Mohawk and a, you know, laser machine gun. It's like, well, let's bust open that hospital and steal the, you know, the, the masks, ha, 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 right? You know, and, and it's that context that's, that rest world creates is like, when you put on those clothes that are not your clothes and, and hat that's not your hat, whichever color it is, right? Then you're, you're becoming something else. Uh, you know, the, the, everything from your, that identifies you outside of Westworld is gone. And, and now you have to create a new identity. And a lot of times when people go to a new place, like they change their names, they change their clothes, they, you know, that's just moving. Right. I have friends when they move from the East Coast to the West Coast, they're like, I'm not David, I'm Dave. And they just they changed like all sorts of stuff about their lives because they wanted to have a reset. Westworld would be even more so, I think. Well, and especially you mentioned talking about the environment. So adding costume and anonymity and then the environmental cues, samurai world, West World, like all of that is very violent right? You walk in and you're seeing some scenario being portrayed by hosts or people or otherwise where somebody gets shot. So there could also be that, you know, whether you walked in expecting to be a white hat or a black hat or whatever, if everybody else around you is going to town on shooting folk, you know, and you get to be this other person that might also elicit some of that as well. No, there That's is kind of like the peer mentality of like a vacation, right? Like if you're on vacation and you're with a group of your friends that like to party, you're going to be totally different than if you're on vacation with your group of friends that all have kids that have brought the kids with, you know, it's depending on which group you went to Westworld with, you could be going out and shooting up the place or you'd be playing the fair maiden and trying to land a cowboy or something. Who knows? And of course, there is some selection bias. People have chosen to go these places. So they've already got whatever qualities are in them that lead them to choose to go there. And even within those individuals, there's still a variety in which the situations are manipulating them. Uh, like he brought up, maybe if you're going to Star Trek world as opposed to cyberpunk world, but it's the nature of the missions that are being given. Even if you chose those one world or the other, you could still be given different missions. Instead of being given an original series mission, maybe you were given a Star Trek Discovery mission, uh, or maybe you were given a Klingon mission. Uh, if, if they assign you that mission or lead you into that mission, they show, especially in season one, when they're showing us our Grand Theft Auto type scenarios, uh, there are games for people to pick up here and along the way to follow. Um, and these can guide you into some behaviors too. Yeah, I think that's a real, you know, thing I, I took away from season one is that like the kinds of things you responded to would lead you like to different areas of the park where different games were in play. And I, I could see someone that was taking on that like the sheriff role might end up in like a little town where he's now defending, you know, a whole bunch of people from uh, something. Whereas, you know, we saw our characters get involved in, you know, explosions and brothels and all sorts of crazy crazy things in s1 um and so i think you, you have a good point and this is this goes to the kind of manipulation that you could do in the park with this kind of data and you know if if it really is that you're going into different parts of the park and how long you stay there affects how much you you pay do they tune that to make people want to stay, you know, figure out, is this person likely to get sucked in and stay over, over stay their stay or something? Like, what could you do with that kind of knowledge of someone's behavior? I feel like if they do that already on social media for us, there's no way they didn't do it at Westworld. I mean, like, it's like if they know exactly which clickbait's going to keep you on their site longer already, by the time we're doing Westworld, they're, they're going to be geniuses at it, and it's going to be like a, a blip on the map to do that. Live action clickbait. 
<laughs> like I, I imagine I what, once they figure out like once they've no i think i think it, it could be uh really really bad if they find someone virtuous and they kind of short circuit those parts of their brain where it's like every every time when they're when their day is up then there's like some new like like disaster or some new like person in need like like a like it's your last day like oh i only, I only paid for seven days of this and then <laughs> you see like a starving child at the side of the road right and you're like oh god i need to go another day like <laughs> that kind of that that's probably a good money maker right there that's mean <laughs> well they're trying to make money is that's like the whole point of of the park it's the business is only supposed to be making uh, generating profits off of these people, not necessarily caring whether or not um, they're maybe hacking something intrinsic and, and deep-seated in humanity, but it's the way of the game. Uh, when well, the, it's actually, I was going to say it's a combination, right? Because we find out that part of it actually is about figuring out the guests and figuring out how they tick and what makes them tick and, and how to change their perceptions and their actions. So. It's kind of both. It's not just about making the money, but also about decoding those behavioral like drivers. It's funny. Instead so of it just all being observation, you could like go like full Stanford prison experiment, Milgram experiment, where you start like specifically intentionally giving people roles or putting people in situations and putting them in the context of these particular robots in order to see if they would do X or do Y to what degree. And the people running the park are shown to make deliberate changes to in specific individual scenarios. And of course, that sounds a little more haphazard than when we would have what we call a true experiment, but maybe they've got a pattern to how they're doing that overall. Is some people will become uninhibited in these environments and do things they thought they would not. Other people are getting manipulated into doing things they would not. Because some people go in and say, I'm not going to, you know, you know, shoot the robot kid, and you know, by day three, or oh, they're already shooting robot kids. And someone goes, I did not spend all this money to come, you know, engage in trying to keep this family friendly with Alan's old work. I'm not going to engage <laughs> in relationships with a, a hug bot in, you know, Maeve, Maeve Saloon. And, and yet somehow they, it's like they didn't spend that much money to do that thing that they could go to certain places in the world, but they're so much more like real people. And people, some, not everybody, but some will, that will be what will attract them or maybe which they may get guided into. I've heard people talk about going to different places. Oh, I'm not going to drink there. And then they're drunk by the end of the night. You know, they, you know, like someone's first visit to a strip club and they think, I'm not going to pay money for one of these stupid lap dances. And yet by the end of the evening, that guy has spent $800 on lap dances <laughs> and more. So different situations bring out unexpected behavior in individuals. Get more, a little more into some of the very specific tech about the host themselves. Say you're, you're building a host. What do you need to do to create one that can very effectively pass for a human being? What needs to be in there? Quite a lot. Um, because like, like if you want to create a performance, right, that, that, that uh, mimics a human being that's not interactive, um, you know, you can, we can, we can fake it, right? We can fake it in, in uh, with, like, you can even do it like with a cartoon. They've had a thing where they have like these blocks moving around on a screen and they're only blocks and people say, well, uh, the, the big one is trying to chase the little one and the two little ones work together. And so our brains do that. Um, but as soon as you interact with it, I, I mean, uh, people remember your name. They remember different people's names in different ways. There's this whole, um, you know, uh, uh, library of things that people do to try to manage the information that they take in. So above and beyond getting a skin that's realistic and getting um, a dialogue that's realistic, there's going to be need to be a core in there where the agents respond in a more or less appropriate way. I mean, it would knock you out of the realism if you're tr if someone says, well, let me lead you to uh, this place where you can defend us from these, these bandits, and the guy gets stuck trying to go around a bush, right? <laughs> as would happen, as happens in some, you know, video games today. They're going to have to nail 
all of those basic components before they even play the game of making it realistic for humans. Right. I, I haven't actually. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go ahead and admit that I haven't actually started season three yet. Do they ever? Do they have they addressed uh, what what the Westworld robots like run off of? Like, do no. they got lithium batteries in there? Do they have a fuel cell and somehow food? Kind of, no. They just because those robots are impressive. The the one of the <laughs> toughest parts of of having a robot just kind of exist in the physical world is the power supply, like battery tech. Oh my gosh compared to like, you know, like there's no Moore's law for batteries. Like there's, we don't have an exponential growth in energy density, right? But these robots are just on what all day, every day they, they kind of go to sleep, but I don't know, maybe they've got an induction charging system throughout the bottom of the entire park. But I was, all right, so I was, I was wondering if they addressed that, I guess they did. Well, oh, that, that, that is such a thing for, such a thing for real robotics is just like, oh, well, I guess we're done for the day because uh, the <laughs> robot's out of power and now it's got a charge. Or if you have one that's got swappable batteries, you're there, okay, I'm going to go get some out of the charger and come back and like, let me bring over a second. Oh, uh, yes. So it's so like, yeah, I, I, that's like the most thing if you could bring back is not the computational power, just give us the Westworld robot batteries. <laughs> they all have little nuclear generators inside and they still shoot each other, which seems a little dangerous, but. <laughs> Every, maybe that's also why so much of the adventure is in the daytime. They have solar, they're solarly charged. Why, uh, every, just every, the resets are all in the middle of the night because that's when those suckers are about to wear down anyway. Right, okay. right. Dolores goes off on an adventure with Billy for a week and he never sees her stop and plug herself into something. <laughs> yeah. We do know they can eat. Do they, do they, what do they do with it though? Do they actually get anything out of it or does it just kind of go into a sack in their bodies that has to be sucked out later? Maybe they burn it. If they eat it, <laughs> they, 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 they burn it and it gets turned into a fuel in a much more efficient way than we, we have. And they have like a, like a thermoelectric generation kind of a thing going on. Well, we do know too, we see in the first couple seasons that they don't ever seem to get drunk when they're drinking either. And then in season three, we see drugs introduced and that doesn't have an effect as well. So I think they're definitely burning off anything that's going into their systems in a way that it's not affecting them. So. And at least it would give them some kind of a body temperature because in the original, in the first movie, the, the whole, the, the, the way they distinguished between hosts and guests was that the, the host, the robots did not actually have like a body temperature, correct? Were they were like room temperature? They were, they were very cool, yeah. That was what uh, the sensor in the guns would detect uh, before right. firing. Yeah, that's one thing critical. It's like either, uh, we, we've talked about our weapons before when we've had our, our weapons expert too. Those guns, how in the world are they hurting the host, shooting windows, but not killing a human being? It could be, okay, there's sensors in every single one of those things or it has sensors so it knows when to shoot. Now in the old movie, it would not fire if pointed at a human being based on the body temperature. In the modern one, it would still fire at the person but would not really hurt them. They might feel a punch, but it would not it really It kind of turned them. into like a paintball almost if it, yeah, if it was it, like a squid or something. Yeah. yeah, it's like it either had two kinds of bullets that it could switch between the two uh, or the hosts were pro it was built into their bodies squib like yeah if if they get that little thing hitting them which wouldn't really hurt a human being then to have some blood pop out of them at any random location in the head but i don't know when you shoot them through the head you've really blown a hole through their head yeah it's it's hard it's hard to say i i think that some of this is just kind of hand wavy because like you can start to imagine like at one point the man in black is getting shot up and he's like this is what i live for and you see the stuff hitting him in the back so it definitely has like a paintball like effect but then the idea that you could make it reliable enough to blow through and a host's head and then not uh every once in a while take out a human being i think it's it, it's it's uh, it's really difficult. I mean, I could imagine that the hosts have a compound, and the the whatever's in the paintball substance actually becomes explosive, in a little way when the stuff hits them. But that wouldn't explain a window unless all the windows are made out of like a candy glass that also is explosive. And then you're like, okay, it's you know. 
I mean, yeah, it, it, on top of that, I think when they're in Shogun World, like, they, they straight up also, that, that those same rules apply to the swords, don't they? Don't they say that the swords mm-hmm. also are not capable of hurting the guests and only the, it's like, it's a sword. And it gets, it gets less sharp if, it, if you hit a person with it, like but that then, one. But then it suddenly sharpens, just like those <laughs> bullets suddenly become dangerous once they go into, hey, let's kill the human mode. Yeah, the sword one is is a real head scratcher. And the bullets are also, but the the swords is like you know a whole level above that. I we talked know. about it last time, saying it could be it could have something to do with the force. Like there could be a metered force the minute the blade, kind of like um, if you if you've ever seen a table saw that's got a sensor in it that the minute flesh comes into contact, drops the blade down, kind of something like that. Where if the blade touches actual human skin, the force automatically is like stops or something in the robot itself but it wouldn't explain if a human got a hold of it what a human could do to another human you know because they're obviously not metered in any way like like say you had a, a liability sharp... thing oh yeah like yeah it's all liability good lord that's like we shouldn't talk about like the liability of westworld but like so let's say you had that super sharp sword and it the blade like retracted inside the sword and you whacked me over the head with it i'm gonna have a hell of a welt even if the the sharp part like somehow dives in there and and um you know if it was like na- if it was nano machines or something then maybe you know the the blade is made out of utility fog and it kind of puffs up when it hits you or something but then they could do anything in the park and so it's like there's this little bit almost of magic to that it's like i don't want to ask too many questions about that cuz then i yeah, there's definitely some near future magic going on. I, I like to, I now, I'm now imagining that Westworld's, is, uh, the, their insurance, their liability insurance is entirely funded by Elon Musk because no <laughs> one else will insure them at this point. <laughs> All right. Uh, two part question. I sound like somebody coming up to a microphone convention. I have a two part question. But, uh, <laughs> well, the first one is no obvious science to it, the second one is what comes back to it. Do you have a favorite host? Mine is Maeve. Maeve, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I oh, I I like uh, what's her name Clementine, the one that they they sort of get Maeve's programming into at the end of season two to sort of like act as a as a counter Maeve. She's she's got that uh, crazy manic uh, Helena Bottom Carter energy that I that I really like at the end of that one. And, and just that, that actress's unreal eyes really play to that too. <laughs> okay. I would have to say my favorite is the one with the uh, the snake tattoo. Armistice. Ah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember her. Mm-hmm. So, why do we have a favorite? Is it, are these things really sentient? Or are we falling into some of the same traps we were talking earlier on? Uh, when, when we're becoming attached to one as opposed to another. Why is Maeve, why is Maeve the favorite? It's if, if they aren't real. So, are we accepting the possibility that the machines actually can be sentient? They're presented as having become sentient. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it comes back to like what we were talking about with cosplaying. Um, you know, you you bond with characters and character lines that you just feel like resonate with you in some way. And I think that Maeve's character line of her trying to like do what's right and be able to help people like and not out of a want for control or power, but just to be able to help people. Like, I think that's something that's easy to gravitate towards like for me at least from a character standpoint but it's not it has nothing to do like in my mind I'm not like Maeve's real that's why I like her more it's more like oh this character and the way that they've written this character and the way that she's been developed and and portrayed is is a really great character can we ever know if a machine has actually become sentient hmm that's a that's a great question um and I think the, so, so we got, a, if, if you're a scientist and you study like this, this really seriously, there's always a chance that we're going to find that what defines us is not uh, our programming or our behavior, but something very, very real about how our bodies function. Like it could be that consciousness is part of what it means to be alive. Uh, Searle is a philosopher that believes in that. But for AI guys and cognitive neuroscience guys, we, we push really hard on the idea, well, let's try to explain it the other way. 
And, and in that case, it's like we're starting to get ideas about what makes up consciousness, what makes up uh, emotion, what makes up, you know, memory that we didn't have 10, 20, 30 years ago. Like the, the, like every new edition of the cognitive neurosciences that comes out, there are more discoveries that we make. So I think it's entirely possible that we could say if consciousness is about us integrating everything that we have in the world and having, uh, you know, a thing that we pay attention to and that guides uh, our decision making and that that intellect is being able to then to apply that to anything in our life and saying like now that I've made this, this decision I can look at all of myself and say do I rise to the standard I've set for myself we could actually say well that machine is doing the same kind of thing that a person does when it gets into a when we go into a situation and say well I pick on the white hat or the black hat and a machine could do that too but then we could build it and then find out, well, no, we were wrong. So it's like, I believe the answer is yes, but it's, it could be a harder problem than we think. I, I'm, I, I'm curious, um, uh, Anthony, wh what are your thoughts on um, like some methodology like, uh, like the Turing test or like in fiction, sort of the fictional Voight Kampf test in Blade Runner, like something like that as sort of a, a like uh, metric for telling if we've you know, achieved a sentient machine or not. Right. And I for the viewer who doesn't know, what are these tests? So like oh, the yeah. Ex Go Explain it. it, now that I brought up the subject, Anthony, explain it all. <laughs> oh, you, you can explain it since you asked the question. You asked no, the no, question. I like make him do the work. <laughs> oh, okay. So the, the Turing test, uh, the, the brief version, not going over the whole complicated one that Turing himself set up, the brief version of the Turing test is, do you, you, have, you set up a human and a machine which are being interrogated by an interrogator that can't see them physically and and you're having like a conversational question back and forth and the a machinist said to pass the turing test if the human cannot reliably the, the interrogator cannot reliably distinguish the human from the machine and that is i mean this is when we do generative deep learning when we try to uh uh try to generate output behavior that people do we do this we have one machine that's actually trying to figure out what's fake and one of them that's trying to beat that i think that's just the ante to play the game though because like that that's a very artificial situation now now what happens when you get out there in the world and ask that person to say well yeah you're, you're real now can you um uh you know drive with me on a road trip to you know uh you know portland and let's go visit the sites. And now, well, well, it was a great conversationalist, but it, it can't see, it can't uh, stop and, and go get some soda, if, you know, if, while you're while you're putting getting gas. Like there's thousands and thousands of things that we do, and it's not just the physical bodies in our life. There's an intellectual component to almost every physical task that we do. So I think that like the Turing test is just like the ante. If like we got that far, they'd be like, well, that's that's great. That part of it doesn't suck. Now there's ten thousand more. What, what about just making uh, making the robots click on that uh, checkbox that you sometimes get as a captcha that asks if you're a robot? Well, no, Does that's that a hundred percent. That's a that's a hundred percent reliable. So, oh, okay, good. All right, so I'm actually, glad we got that. <laughs> yeah, so so the deleted scene in Blade Runner, you know, where they're like, okay, now just <laughs> click on this, and he's like, I'll click on this, blam. And, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the Voight Kampf box opens up. It's a hologram projection of the checkbox. <laughs> so, and, and you touched on this. We're, we're, we're pretty close to the end. We've been at this for a while. It flies by. We've done this panel at WonderCon and San Diego Comic-Con after each season. So this is at least our fifth time to do this. And it still flies by pretty quickly. It, these are... Topics that are just fascinating to us, some of it gets into the question of what is a human being? And who could get lost in the machines? Who could fall in love with machines? What would we do? Where are these characters that we're invested in going? And tie back to things we brought up earlier and that Anthony just referred to. Do you think you'd wear the white hat or the black hat on your way to Westworld? And do you think it's still be wearing the same color afterwards? All of you. Hmm. Why don't they have brown? 
<laughs> a gray hat. It's part of the manipulation. <laughs> For me, I'd have to say the white hat. I know myself well enough to know that I would over empathize with every single robot there, but here's where it would go down the rabbit hole. The second some little like kid or like little dog or whatever was in trouble and about to be shot, oh, that's my moment. That's my moment to get past all of my like, we're all humans and I have empathy. Like, mm -mm. <laughs> no. So I'm gonna be like the sheriff white hat character where I still get to like like do all the things, but it's for the re good right reason. You'll be the, the Jack Bauer of Westworld then. Absolutely. <laughs> what hat would you wear, Alan? Oh boy. Um. Uh. I think I would say. Uh. I would wear. I think I would wear a white hat, and then I would just kill like one guy just to see what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> but white hat. White hat. But just one guy, just to, just, just to double check. Like, yeah, yeah, this is the right color hat. Uh, I wasn't into that at all. That was gross. <laughs> I, think, I think I would wear the black hat. But we've, when we've done this panel before, I've said it. Um, so if you've heard this before, then you know. But I would wear it because I have this idea in my mind that the hosts uh, recognize your hat as which path you get to go on. And my worry is that a white hat might be like the PG-13 rating and I want to be able to like have the access and then choose for myself whether or not I like actually do the things. But I don't want this park that, you know, at this point we've decided we've paid a ton of money to be at telling me which one I can't do. So I would, I would do the black hat. I'd probably still lean heavily white, but I would at least have the options to go and see the, the things that the black hat unveils. I guess that's true, right? Because some some people bring their whole families to this stupid park, and they they must have a separate section. For I don't remember them bringing the grown kids, but maybe yeah, maybe they just go to the uh, Wonderland Park. Oh, the Wonderland. Park. Well, there was no, there's the little kid in uh, one, right? And he tells Dolores that she's not real, but I don't remember if he had a hat on or not. Like she was, she was giving, oh, yeah. she was giving the horse water uh, in the field, but I don't, I can't remember the hat no he didn't have a hat on <laughs> ah, so maybe he doesn't get to engage no hat means no no host engagement no hug bots for the little oh, kids yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anthony what hat I, I agree with tamara uh and and uh my dad and i used to watch this show i, I think it was called paladin and he was a hero who wore black okay. so uh out of uh, to honor my dad and to also make sure I'd be able to access all of the park, I would wear black and play white. Oh, interesting. I thought that was Have Gun with Will Travel, the one that had Paladin in it. Yes, Have Gun Will Travel. Yeah, Paladin was the character. You're right. Have Gun Will Travel. Yeah, it's been so it's it's been twenty five years since I watched it with him. He's been gone for a while. But I never you know, watched it, but I was reading trivia about it the other day. At, but well, yeah, it, it, it's, it says the whole idea of like, you cannot be necessarily defined by your costume. And so I, but I would, I think, you know, the white hat might lead you to the, the PG-13 parts of the park and you would want to get your full money's worth. Well, Travis, like uh, you've already made a decision there. <laughs> we can all see what hat you're wearing. <laughs> I, I, I like that reasoning. I don't think it would have crossed my mind though. Uh, I look at the white and black hats, it's pretty obvious what choice they're trying to force you into. And I was like, okay, I, I want to play the white hat role, but I like wearing black. Uh, no, I, I really do. I'm interested in heroic stories. I'm interested in the heroes. And I, I would want to play the hero role. And because some people watching this goes like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. All you people saying you want to be the nice role, you're not all going to be nice. Uh, you're like, you can't play Grand Theft Auto without hurting people. It's like, yes, you can. <laughs> yes, you can. My, my son, Alex, will point out, he will go through Grand Theft Auto and do the heroic stuff all along the way. It's like, okay, maybe you are stealing a fire engine, but you're using it to put out a fire. And he, he has gone all the way through Grand Theft Auto without hurting a single person. And that was a fun game for him. So I, 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 I hope that would be my fun Westworld. All right, well, thank you all uh, for joining us out there. Thank you, panelists. Uh, where can anybody find you online? Aaron. 
Um, you can find me at my site geek on Twitter. Alan. Uh, Google me, Alan Pan. <laughs> Let's just do that. Tamara. Uh, I am at the real Tamara Robertson on Instagram and Facebook and TLNR85 on Twitter. Also, Google me. Anthony. Uh, you can Google me, or uh, my blog is drezan.com, D-R-E-S-A-N.com, and you can find my novels and uh, short story collections on Amazon and other places fine books are sold. I am at Superheroologist on Twitter. Twitter and Facebook are my favorite communications. Honestly, giving me a message through Facebook, you're more likely to reach me than my email. Just look for Travis Langley. It's easy to find me. The books are on Amazon, at Barnes & Noble, all over the place. Uh, thank you all, and happy trails. Thank you.